بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Dear students assalamu alaikum and uh, welcome to the course of 14th to 18th century poetry The topic of uh, today's lecture is uh, a poem by John Donne and the title is A Valediction Forbidding Mourning I am your teacher Muhammad Asif Khan lecturer department of English Kohat University of Science and Technology Dear students agenda for today's class is that first of all I will give you a brief introduction of this poem and uh, I will tell you about uh, the form and the rhyme scheme of uh, this poem After this initial introduction we will analyze this poem stanza by stanza and in the end of uh, this uh, analysis i will give you a task and uh, this task will comprise of uh, explanation of uh, the literary devices which i will identify to you in this poem so starting uh, with the, the introduction of the poem a valediction forbidding mourning this very poem is written by john dun and uh, we know him very well because uh, he is uh, one of the prominent uh, writer of english uh, literature and uh, he was uh, also a politician lawyer and priest but uh, he is most uh, famous for his uh, uh, works which were later on recognized as metaphysical poetry so he is uh, the most important uh, metaphysical poet of uh, the 17th century this very poem a valediction forbidding mourning was uh, written on the occasion of uh, parting from his wife and uh, her name was uh, anne more dun and uh, this event happened uh, in 1611 when john dun was uh, going uh, on a diplomatic mission to france and uh, he was leaving behind uh, his wife in england and uh, for that reason he wrote this poem so this poem a valediction is a farewell speech so dear students this poem cautions against uh, the grief about separation and it uh, affirms uh, the special and particular love the speaker and his lover shares among themselves so this very poem that was written on the occasion when the poet was leaving her wife in england and he was himself going to france so at that moment he wrote this poem and uh, we see that like most of uh, dun's poems this very poem was also published uh, after his death so this is uh, the initial introduction of this poem and uh, now let's see that uh, what is uh, what is the form and uh, meter of uh, this uh, very poem this poem basically is uh, a set of uh, nine quatrains or we can say that uh, this uh, poem consists of nine stanzas and each stanza comprises of uh, four lines and because we name four line stanza as a quatrains so this poem consists of set of nine quatrains and in total we see that there are 36 lines in this poem there is no particular verse form that poet has uh, followed in this poem but uh, one thing that is consistent uh, in terms of uh, the length and uh, style of uh, its stanzas that uh, it comprises of uh, nine stanzas and each stanza consists of four lines the other thing about uh, these uh, stanzas is that each stanza is grammatically complete and uh, all of uh, the stanzas uh, conclude uh, in end stop sentences so we can say that uh, each stanza has a complete meaning 
though these uh, stanzas are interconnected but each stanza completes the sense which it wants to convey to the readers now let's see that uh, what is uh, the meter pattern that is being followed uh, in this very poem a valediction forbidding mourning is uh, consistently iambic tetrameter but uh, there are some deviations from this meter and uh, i'm not going into that detail overall we can say that uh, this poem is uh, written in iambic tetrameter now let's uh, move uh, towards uh, the rhyme scheme of this poem this poem a valediction forbidding mourning follows a simple alternative rhyming scheme and uh, we see that uh, the first line of each stanza rhymes with the third line and in the same way the second line rhymes with the fourth one so the rhyme scheme of uh, this very poem is a b a b again there are couple of uh, deviations here in this poem like uh, we can see in the second uh, stanza and uh, in the same way there is a deviation in the fourth stanza and also we can see a deviation in lines uh, 22 and 24 that is basically stanza number 6 so these are some of the deviations uh, from uh, the normal pattern that is being followed in this poem now let's move uh, towards uh, the reading of this poem and uh, with the reading of this poem i will also do line by line analysis of the poem so let's move uh, towards stanza number 1 as virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go whilst some of their sad friends do say the breath goes now and some say no this is the first stanza of uh, the poem and we see that uh, the speaker begins uh, this very poem with an image of death he is speaking uh, on uh, the death of a man and we see that uh, it is very clear from this uh, these very lines that uh, this very man is a virtuous man and uh, due to his uh, good nature his death comes peacefully so here dun compares dying uh, in this uh, very occasion to uh, a phrase that is uh, whisper to their souls to go so we can say that uh, here the death is uh, nothing uh, like a traumatic or a shocking or painful or a stressful event it is happening very calmly and peacefully so all these things are happening in a peaceful environment though we see that death is not uh, that uh, peaceful thing but uh, the poet is saying that uh, all these things are happening to this virtuous man in a very peaceful manner when virtuous man silently departs from this wor- world we see that uh, he does not show any sign of uh, agony or uh, we see that uh, there is uh, no such uh, feelings of pain and all these things are happening very peacefully here some friends are present uh, on the occasion Uh, and they are uh, sitting uh, by the side of uh, that virtuous man and we see that uh, this man is uh, breathing his last and uh, some of uh, his friends are saying that uh, that his breath goes now whereas some disagrees with uh, them and they say that no he is alive still now so this uh, dying man is not alone here and uh, there are friends around uh, the bed of this man and uh, they are unable to decide whether or not uh, this man is uh, dead so uh, his final moments are very peaceful that there is no sign to tell 
uh, the witnesses or the people who are sitting there that uh, the death has uh, come. So they speak to one another asking if the breath goes now or not. That is uh, the end of this stanza. So very unusual type of beginning. Now let's move towards uh, the second stanza. So let us melt and make no noise. No tear floods nor sigh tempests move. Twere profanation of our joys. To tell the laity our love. This stanza might come as uh, something of uh, surprise uh, to the readers that are new to the dance use of uh, complicated uh, use of conceit uh, in his poetry. We see that uh, rather explaining uh, what uh, the first stanza was uh, all about. This stanza, which is the second stanza of this uh, poem, it adds uh, additional information uh, to the to the readers and we see that the speaker is comparing the peaceful death of uh, the virtuous uh, man that has been mentioned in the first stanza to the love that the speaker shares uh, with the, the intended listener or the person uh, whom the speaker is addressing and uh, when they separate they go apart without uh, the tear floods. There are no tears. These words tear floods and sigh tempests are basically hyperboles. And we see that uh, there, there are no tears and there are no sighs. Because uh, the speaker or the poet, they consider these uh, tears and sighs as uh, a shallow superficial things. So they are separating so let us melt, here the poet is using uh, a metaphor and he says that so let us melt and make no noise, no tears, no sighs and uh, just uh, we are going to separate. So Dunn's speaker sees the way other partners uh, are around one another and uh, he is very much well aware of uh, their relationships. So uh, here he is uh, saying that he and his partner would never be so stupid uh, as to expose and as to show their emotions to the common people because uh, he is uh, not like uh, the common lovers. Their love is not like the common lovers love and uh, they are not like them. So to our profanation of uh, our joys, to tell the laity, laity means ordinary people. We are not going to tell or we are not going to demonstrate our love uh, to the common people. He states that it would be a profanation. Profanation means disgrace to their joy if they expose uh, their love to the common people. So they are not going to weep or they are not uh, going to sigh when they will separate. And they will make no noise. And, uh, and they will remain on that high ground that is uh, very much above those uh, lesser loves uh, which uh, Dan is not going to follow in his life. Now let's move uh, towards uh, the third stanza. And uh, here the poet says, Moving of the earth brings harms and fears. Men reckon what it did and meant. But trepidation of the spheres, Thou greater far is innocent. In this stanza, we see that uh, poet uh, introduces another image and uh, that very image is uh, of a natural disaster moving of the earth and from moving of the earth he means an earthquake and uh, uh, it is the thing that is uh, unexpected and uh, we we are unable to explain this very phenomena 
and we all know that uh, these earthquakes they bring uh, along with the, them uh, harms and fears so here the poet is saying that uh, moving of the earth harms and man think what it did and what it meant that is uh, basically poet wants to emphasize uh, the absurdity of uh, making a big deal over the speaker's departure so just uh, he is uh, narrating that departure's event and uh, that valediction or uh, farewell event and uh, here he is trying to emphasize it uh, more and more and making it a big deal the next two lines of uh, this stanza are a bit uh, more difficult to understand because uh, these lines refer to heavenly bodies or uh, celestial bodies and uh, the spheres of uh, those bodies he says that uh, they still shake and vibrate in reaction to other events if one event happens uh, in this universe all other bodies of uh, in this universe they get affected with that very mishap so here the speaker is describing their own trepidation and uh, he is describing it uh, as a greater shaking than that which uh, an earthquake is able to inflict uh, but uh, the poet says that uh, this earthquake or this shaking is unseen and innocent one so its implications are far greater than uh, the earthquakes that happen in this universe but uh, he is saying that uh, the thing that is happening between them is uh, unseen and that is innocent so this is uh, another metaphor for how the speaker sees uh, his relationship and uh, it is not uh, the shoei earthquake but uh, the much more powerful shaking of uh, the celestial spheres uh, in which uh, all the bodies are revolving or all the bodies are tied so dear students uh, this uh, is uh, all about the third stanza now let's move uh, towards the fourth stanza the poet says dull sublunary lovers love whose soul is sense cannot admit absence because it doth remove those things which elemented it and uh, you will see that speaker returns to describe uh, the lesser love of uh, the other people around them and he says that it is dull and it is uh, sublunary and uh, you know the word uh, lunar it is basically connected with moon and sublunary means uh, that uh, it is uh, that region of uh, geocentric cosmos that is below the moon but uh, in poetry we often see that uh, it means uh, something that exists uh, under the moon rather in the sky but these very people who are influenced by or who are uh, subluminary these people in their relationships uh, are often driven by their senses and uh, therefore we see that uh, the soul of the relationship uh, uh, of these uh, sublunary lovers is uh, based on what one senses can determine it is connected with senses so the relationship of sublunary lovers is uh, based on senses and uh, we see that uh, for them physical presence is of the utmost importance for these lovers physical presence is very important and they cannot admit absence actually the line was cannot admit absence this is run on line and the idea is traveling to the next line we see cannot admit absence these lovers they cannot admit that uh, their lover is absent so physical presence is very important for them so physical presence is uh, the key in uh, in their relationship and uh, according to dun everything shallow lovers 
have with one another is based on their senses, especially on touch and sight. So for him, these lovers are dull and uh, these are uh, lesser lovers. Now let's see that to what Dunn says in uh, stanza number five. But we by a love so much refined that ourselves know not what it is. Enter assured of the mind. Care less eyes, lips, and hands to miss. In this stanza of uh, the poem, A Valediction, Forbidding Mourning, poet provides uh, a contrast uh, to the fourth stanza. And uh, uh, here the poet returns to his uh, own relationship uh, with uh, his wife, and he speaks of himself and his wife as we. But we by a love so much refined. So we means the poet or the speaker and his wife. They have refined or well-tuned or cultured relationship. Their relationship is a refined relation. Their relationship is cultured and a well-tuned relationship. And this very relationship is beyond the physical world. And this love is uh, so beyond the physical world that they, though they are physical beings, have uh, difficulty in understanding this very love because they are having a physical body, but their love is above that physicalities. So they are themselves unable to understand that what type of love they have. So they know not what it is. So poet says, that ourselves know not what it is. And uh, in the next two lines, the poet repeats the fact that the love the speaker and his wife have is a spiritual one because that is just present there in the mind. It is more mental than physical. So this means they are inter-assured of the minds and do not care for the eyes lips and hands so they they are not having any physical love their love is about that and it is a type of spiritual love when they uh, part these are not the elements they will miss about one another because they are not having physical love so their hands their lips their eyes they will not uh, miss these things of one another because they are in a spiritual love of one another. In the sixth stanza, the poet says, Or two souls therefore, which are one, thou I must go, endure not yet a breach, but an expansion, like gold to airy thinness beat. The poet begins this very stanza in a very straightforward uh, and a very recognizable declaration about uh, his relationship, uh, which we can uh, name as a marriage, because uh, he says that they might have uh, two separate souls, but uh, now they act as one. Our two souls, therefore, which are one. They might have uh, two separate souls, but now they act as one. It is due to this fact that when they part, they will not endure a breach. There is no break. There is no breach. But it is basically their parting, their separation. That is basically an expansion of their love. So their love will stretch as we see that gold stretches when it is beaten thin. So here the poet has referred a very important fact because he has chosen gold as a representative of their love. So he recognizes the elements of his relationship in, in the durability and the beauty of the gold. So he says their love will stretch as gold does when it is beaten thin. 
So it is same even when pushed to the limits. If, uh, if you are pushing that goal or if you are beating that very thing to its limits, even then it will not break, it will not breach, it will endure that very thing. And even uh, we see that uh, there is expansion or development or growth uh, in this very relationship. So the poet is saying that our two souls, therefore, they are one. Thou, I must go, though he is going from here, endure they will bear, they will suffer this very separation. Not yet a breach, but it is not a break. It is just an expansion. It is just a development or a growth. As we see that uh, when the gold is uh, beaten the, with a hammer, it uh, stretches, it expands. This is uh, the message of this very poem. Now let's see uh, in the stanza 7, the poet says, If they be two... They are two so, as stiff twin compasses are two. Thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move, but doth if the other do. Here the poet discusses the image of a, a compass. And uh, it is a, a very famous uh, conceit that is being used by Dunn and often referred by many analysts and uh, we will uh, see that how he used this conceit uh, or a metaphor in this poem. The poet says that that uh, he and uh, his wife they are uh, like uh, two feet uh, of uh, a compass and his wife uh, is being uh, the fixed foot of the device. But before referring to the compass, John Dunn goes back on his previous statement about their oneness. And he knows there might be some doubt of their inter-assured or spiritual relationship. So he makes this very thing clear. And he is acknowledging here that if they... It means that uh, he and his wife are two, then they are the two legs of a compass. If they be two, they are actually two legs of a same compass. So Dunn speaks of his wife being uh, the fixed foot of the device. And he says, thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move. And uh, he says that... Uh, the steady soul that remains grounded and that never makes a show or uh, that never moves, that is his wife. And his wife only moves if the other do, meaning when the poet moves. But that if the other do. Wife is a fixed foot and she makes no show to move. It uh, moves only when the other foot moves. So this is uh, the seventh stanza. Now let's see that what po a poet wants to convey us in the eighth stanza. Poet says, And thou it in the center sit, Yet when the other far doth room, It leans and hearkens after it, And grows erect as that comes home. So the poet describes the movement of uh, the fixed foot and he says that uh, it is uh, in the center of their world and uh, everything revolves around that very foot. Then if uh, the other leg, the one that is uh, being compared to the dun, it uh, decides uh, to roam far into the distance, it leans. This is the only movement that uh, his wife makes. When he needs her, she hearkens, she listens uh, to Dunn or uh, it uh, pay attention to the other uh, partner and it, it, it assumes the position of the one who tries to be attentive as if uh, to hear what is being said. So when he needs her, she hearkens after him and then straightens up again or grows erect or goes straight when he comes home 
or return from that fixed point. In the last stanza, the poet says, Such will thou be to me, who must, like the other foot, obliquely run. Thy firmness makes my circle just, and makes me end where I begin. In these four lines, the poet describes the matter for in full, and we see that the speaker or the poet is very much addressing the lines to his wife, and he tells her that she will be to him the line that brings him back. And she has a firmness that makes his circle just. Thy firmness makes my circle just. Or it is she who can keep the poet within a limited area and make me end where I began. No matter what he does or where he rooms, she will always get him back to where he began. So this is the poem of John Donne. And uh, in this poem, we have uh, covered uh, the uh, nine stanzas. Now I will show you some of uh, the literary devices. And uh, I have highlighted uh, these devices for you. In the first stanza, in the very first line, we see there is a simile. And uh, you can easily identify that uh, this very line is beginning with the word as. I'm not going to explain these devices to you. It's your task that you have to see that uh, how these devices are being uh, used uh, by the poet and why these devices are named like this. Like uh, in the second stanza, we see there is a metaphor. So let us melt and make no noise. It is a metaphor. Here, uh, we do not see a comparison with the words like uh, as and like. Tear floods, sigh tempests, hyperbole. The poet is exaggerating. We see in the stanza 6, there is a paradox. Our two souls, therefore, which are one. And here we see like. This very line is starting with the word like. There is a simile. Again, there is a simile in the line number 25 and 26. In line number 31, we have a personification. So these are some of the devices which are being used, but there are many, many other which you can identify and which you can highlight. So this is the task for you that you have to explain these very literal devices which I highlighted to you. And if you find any other, you can also list those very devices uh, in your uh, notes. Thank you very much for listening passionately. I hope that now you will be clear about uh, the poem, A Valediction, Forbidding Mourning by Jantan. Allah Hafiz.